You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. And before we begin, I want to remind you that there is a website associated with this podcast called wealthformula.com. Lots of resources there for you. It's also where you can sign up for various lists, including uh, our credit investor club, investor club as we call it for short. That is, um, if you are accredited, you can sign up for there and um, get onboarded. Um, and it's where we potentially will be looking for some of the distressed assets that are out there that uh, hopefully we can, we can take advantage of uh, over the next few months. Again, you got to be accredited. What does that mean? You make $200,000 per year or $300,000 if you file jointly for at least two years consecutively or and or a million dollars of uh, net worth outside of your personal home. All right. Now, again, sign up wellformula.com. But let's talk this week about the economy a little bit more. Last week, I called the economy schizophrenic. And actually, that's an insult to schizophrenics. This is simply a dysfunctional economy. It's the product of a good idea called capitalism with excessive intervention, namely by the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. Today's economy reminds me a little bit of a movie that I liked back in the day, and I'm sure you remember it. It's called Jurassic Park. Right there was these, you know, this amusement park with uh, the, where they made these dinosaurs and all that. And uh, anyway, it turned out pretty bad. And the lesson of it was altering the natural order of things has unexpected consequences, it's like a T Rex eating you alive. And similarly, the Fed printed money for years and years and kept interest rate at artificially low levels, even when it probably didn't need to. Sure, raising rates 10 years ago might have caused a little recession along the way, but guess what, folks? That is normal. That's the way it's been. That's the way an economy is supposed to be. But instead, they decided to take intervention to a new level. And Rather than seeing the role of business cycles in a healthy economy, they became reactive. They became reactive in a, in a, in a very different way to equity markets, to like the stock market. And to be clear, keeping... The stock market in a bubble has never been a mandate of the Federal Reserve, but there they were. They would threaten to raise rates and the markets would panic sell. And then the Fed would say, hey, 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 we're just kidding here. We're just, we'll back off. Okay, we'll back off. So effectively what was happening was the Fed was playing a game of chicken with investors, right? You know, those two cars coming at each other back in the, they, they just in the movies and 50s movies that you watch, they're coming back at each other and then somebody flinches and, and turns off the highway, uh, that, that's basically what was going on. The Fed was playing a game of chicken with investors, but the investors kept winning over and over again. The, the, the Fed would never win. And, and so much so that people began to believe that the Fed wouldn't ever let the markets go into any kind of free fall. So then that's what was going on there. And then, and then COVID happened, which was, well, if you needed a time to really get in there and, you know, lower interest rates, print money, all that stuff. Well, it's hard to argue against that happening in COVID. And in addition to that, you had true helicopter money that was coming into the hands of ordinary Americans by the U.S. government. Now, that's not a bad thing. But you see, when the Fed prints money, it lands in the arms of banks who, well, they simply hoard it. And of course, that's not a good thing either, but that's what happened. So it doesn't really get out there on Main Street. But this time, things were different. People needed the money to eat. So the government put it in their hands and that along with a high demand for goods because of crippled supply chains lit the fire of rapid inflation, the worst we have seen in 40 years. Of course, somehow the Fed still didn't realize that it was a uh, it was real in, in inflation at first. They, they didn't really act quickly. They called it transient. And in hindsight, gradual increasing of those rates as soon as they started seeing that inflation probably would have made sense and it might have you know might have prevented the need for the extreme measures that, that they ended up putting in which was like they waited for things to get out of hands and then put their foot on the gas like never before accelerating uh, rates at a slope never before seen in american history now where are we now? Well, we're sort of in no man's land. Inflation seems to be getting under control. There's some distress in the economy as seen by various bank failures, corporate bankruptcies at 2010 levels. Well, you know, we're seeing what happens, what's happening in with real estate. 
big mess. But then we get, oh, we added 339,000 jobs last month. That's not good. I mean, it's good, but it's not good because now there's mixed signals, right? Why? Why is there 339,000 jobs added last month when everything seems to be kind of, I don't know, uh, kind of like not good? Um, here's what I think. And again, I'm, you know, I'm no economist, right? But here's what I think is going on. I don't know. I don't have an answer why it is, but I think what it has to do again was with this optimism that the Fed will change course and become dovish with rates again. In other words, businesses may not believe that the Fed will let things get that bad before they reverse course and start cutting rates. I mean, if the if businesses truly, truly believed that we were headed into a deep recession, they wouldn't be adding 339,000 jobs last month, right? Reminds me of a spoiled child that knows if he whines long enough, his parents are going to give in. And in that case, you have to remember, it's not the kid's fault that he behaves that way. It's, it's a parent who taught him to behave that way, right? Similarly, businesses and investors don't really believe the Fed when it says enough is enough about low rates and money printing. And frankly, I'm not sure that I do either. So I don't, I don't you know, and I'm a business owner. So there you go. So that's this non-economist take on what's going on with this economy. There's a good chance that I've made several flawed statements in my argument. But as I said before, I'm trying really hard to make sense of it so I can move forward. And I thought I'd share with you. Now, for today's show, we have a real economist, Richard Duncan. He's been on the show several times, and he's one who spoke to Congress recently. He's a very impressive guy, and he's written multiple books and has some pretty good ideas on what he thinks America needs to do to move ahead. He also has some pretty good ideas about what's going on with the economy now. And I think it'll be a very interesting interview for you to listen to. And we will have that after these messages. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, uh, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast is Richard Duncan. He's no stranger to the show. He's been on several times before. He is the editor of a great newsletter called Macro Watch. Uh, Richard, welcome back. Buck, thank you so much for having me back. It's great to great to be with you. And uh, you're in Bangkok again, is that right? That's right. Very good. Um, so yeah, so you know, we talked, I, I guess, 15 months or ago or so. Uh, I think we were kind of like in the middle of, uh, well, you know, COVID, uh, the thick of COVID or something like that. Um, what have you been up to? So. Yes, a lot has changed in the last 15 months. It seems like every time we speak, something new and dramatic has changed the world. Uh, but what I've been up to is thank, thanking God that COVID has wound down and we can begin to return to a normal kind of life. For, for two and a half years, I was staying at our house up in northern Thailand in, in Chiang Rai, way out in the middle of the countryside to to avoid to avoid COVID, and over the last six or nine months now, I've been back in Bangkok most of the time and enjoying life once again in the big city, mask free, and have even begun to travel to other countries again. So that's all very welcome. Yeah, you were uh, in the U.S. Uh, recently, I guess, talking to Congress. Um, that's right. Talk a little bit about what you were doing there and uh, the message you were delivering. Right. So last time we spoke, 15 months ago, my my latest book had just been released. It's called The, the Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. And the goal of that book was to really try to persuade the American public and U.S. policymakers that we're living in a new economic environment now in this post-Bretton Woods era that really does make it possible for the government to invest in a very large scale in new industries and technologies. And so without going through the book again, that's the theme. And I had hoped to, as I, as I said, persuade policymakers that, that this is in fact the case. And so in, in February, I was invited to make a speech at a policy dinner in Washington 
to a 15 members of the House Ways and Means Committee to explain the ideas in the book and to explain my views on how the United States can finance the next American century to make sure that the the first American century is not the last, but indeed only the first of many. And so I had that chance to do that at the end of February. So I was really thrilled about that. And um, I, I hope to perhaps influence them a little bit. Time will tell, I suppose. Politics How were you received? How were your ideas received? I think the speech went very well. You can generally tell by looking at the people's faces. No one got up and stormed out. So I think it was well received. And I was invited to make this speech by Congressman John Larson from Connecticut, who is a, a Democrat. And this was in, and, and, and it was with his colleagues, the Democrat colleagues on the House Ways and Means Committee. And this was not too long after the, the Democrats lost control of the House in November and the Republicans took over as chairman of the House Ways and, Committee, Ways and Means Committee and all the other committees in January. And so they were still, of course, disappointed that they had lost, that the Democrats had lost control of the House. And my recommendations to them were that the United States, as you know, last year, in the middle of last year, August perhaps, the Chips and Science Act was passed, which allocates $380 billion of government financing for investments in new industries and technologies, which is exactly what my book calls for, with $50 billion being allocated for building semiconductor manufacturing facilities within the United States, and the rest being allocated to all the other industries and technologies of the future that I discussed, things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotech, nanotech, neurosciences, robotics, clean energy, and so forth. And so that is something that um, had been passed during the previous Congress when the Democrats were in control, along with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, with the Inflation Reduction Act funneling, we now know what's likely to be you know, very large amounts of money into uh, new industries uh, in energy-related energies and clean energies. So a lot ha- happened uh, in that previous Congress. And they were disappointed, I think, that they had lost, the, of course. And my my suggestion to them was to you know, to run on a platform next time of, you know, an America can invest. You know, we can grow by investment, investing in new industries and technologies. We don't have to settle for 1% or 2% GDP growth a year. We can invest on such a large scale that we could induce a new technological revolution that would turbocharge U.S. economic growth. And at the same time, over, over the next decade, produce technological miracles and medical marvels and generally make everyone's lives better. So rather than continuing on in this long period of stagnation that the United States has been in now for decades, uh, that has resulted in the the middle class being hollowed out and disappointed with their prospects in life and the prospects for their children. I think a winning platform for Democrats would be to very aggressively run on a platform of we are going to invest aggressively and we are going to make this economy grow on a scale that you know uh, hasn't been seen for decades. Now, I would propose the same policy to the Republican Party, but the Republican Party has chosen instead to um, campaign apparently for austerity, or at least the, the House Republicans have, as demonstrated by them holding the government hostage uh, a few weeks ago in order to impose austerity on the country rather than new investment and growth. Now, typically, I I try to avoid politics and don't take sides. But on this issue, I'm pretty 
passionate. I believe that the way forward for the United States is for us to invest in new industries, new technologies. And so, among other things, the economy will grow faster, but also so that we're not overtaken by China, which is now investing more in research and development than the United States is, and therefore is posing a real and grave threat to U.S. national security and all of our futures. So investment is the way forward, and that's, that's what I believe in, and that's what the book is all about. And so I was thrilled to have an opportunity to discuss this with members of the House Ways and Means Committee. I would say this much, though, in terms of the, of the political aspect of this, um, neither, neither party is in the business of austerity when they're actually in power. Um, you know, there, I, I think that it's all posturing. Right. It's all posturing, whether it's a Democratic Party or a Republican Party. The idea of of uh, austerity in terms of fiscal austerity is something of the past. I don't think that's real. I think it's something that you just kind of, you know, use as a, a mantra to oppose the other party. Well, sadly, I think you're right. I would advise the Republicans to uh, look back at their most successful policy of the last several decades and that was under President Reagan. Under President Reagan had the U.S. government invest very aggressively in the U.S. military. And that turbocharged the economy. We had very high economic growth during the 1980s. And it resulted in bankrupting the Soviet Union uh, at the end of the 80s. And so that was their most successful policy. And that's the policy they should adopt now. But instead, they seem to, uh, uh, you know, to have adopted the opposite approach. of austerity. Well, at least for now. And if there's, you know, at the end of the day, again, I will just reiterate, I think it's all posturing because, I mean, the Trump administration was not short on spending. Right. So uh, I was short on getting any bills passed that actually invested in anything like infrastructure or or chips and science act or. or well, I you know, listen, I, I don't know. Again, I, I just think that, you know, not n not political either way here, but I just think that both parties are kind of have have not had the best of uh, ideas ahead. I mean, you know, I mean, I think the Democratic Party is also. Um, leaned in a very uh, sort of socialist way that doesn't necessarily, you know, promote growth in the economy. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that that changes uh, with regard to any any either party. And I think investment is important, but I think you know, um, you know, just giving away things is not particularly helpful. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm more or less a one-issue guy. My issue is I want to see the government invest aggressively in new industries and technologies in cooperation with the private sector, actually letting the private sector managing, manage, manage these businesses. But um, yes, so personally, I think you know, we could, while it's a noble goal to want to give everyone free health care, we can treat everyone with kidney disease for the next 1,000 years, or we can invest and we can cure kidney disease within the next decade. Exactly. So let's shift gears a little bit. What's going on in this economy here, uh, Richard? <laughs> it is a very confusing economy for me, very confusing. And then I, you know, just what I'm looking at, and again, I'm not an economist, but I look at these, uh, you know, obviously we had this uh, crazy, uh, you know, or not crazy, but this significant, um, you know, in, inflationary uh, environment, uh, followed by the the Fed initially kind of in denial, um, you know, saying that it was tra transitory, then turning around and, you know, increasing rates at this incredible rate, um, and then uh, now inflation seems to be down a little bit, down to four percent, I believe, last month, and. But in the meantime, you still have a huge job growth, right? I mean, or at least new jobs. 339,000, I believe, was the, the number last month. In the midst of that, I also understand we're at 2009 levels of, of corporate bankruptcy. So it, it's, uh, it seems to me it's a rather schizophrenic economy. What's your take on, on what's actually happening here? Right. It, it is a schizophrenic economy, and it's difficult to to parse through all the various uh, contradictory indicators 
that we're receiving because things are really not playing out the way that would generally be expected. I think most economists have been expecting the U.S. economy to go into recession for quite a long time now. And although it did flirt with recession during the first half of last year, it, it recovered. And as you said, since then, the job growth has been strong and generally the economy has been much stronger than has been expected. And one of the main indicators, I think there are four or five points that would suggest the economy should go into recession and that asset prices would fall. But at the same time, I think there are another four or five points that point in the opposite direction. So let's let's start with the with the negative points first. I always focus on credit growth. I think credit growth is very is I think it's been the main driver of economic growth for for decades. And typically, if credit, and by what I mean by credit, credit is the flip side of debt. So all the debt in the country, government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, financial sector debt, all the debt. If it grows by less than 2% a year, adjusted for inflation, typically that causes the US economy to go into recession. So between 1950 and 2008, just before the crisis of 2008 began, every time credit grew by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, without fail, the US economy went into recession. Well, now, we're, things, we're illiquid. Uh, the, the lending market is illiquid right now, right? I mean, it's certainly in, in real estate I and mean, uh, in small business. It, it's not a, a particularly um, healthy lending market. Well, that's right. And so now for almost two years, credit growth has been well below 2% adjusted for inflation. But we haven't gone into recession. So that's a big anomaly in, in, in my framework of looking at the world. And that's the, now looking ahead, it does look like credit is going to continue to slow. But of course, that's nominal credit growth, looks like it's going to continue to slow. But at the same time, it also looks like inflation is going to become lower. So real credit growth, um, is a bit less certain in terms of what it's going to do. But just in the last quarter, if you look at the financial accounts of the United States, we, we've seen some pretty significant developments, uh, particularly with the household sector. The, the government is the biggest debtor, but the household sector is the next biggest debtor. And as of the first quarter, household sector borrowing slowed down very, very sharply, it almost flattened out. Uh, more, more mortgage growth was very depressed, and also even consumer credit was very depressed. So given how high interest rates are and the, the likelihood that they're going to move even higher over the coming months, at least a little at least another 25 basis points, it looks like, then it does look like household spending borrowing will be weak. And this does suggest that, credit growth will, will remain weak, and that should be enough to push the U.S. Into, to, into recession. Now, I would say that's the biggest negative. So let me flip to the let, biggest let, positive. Let me ask you this, though, before you move on. How long generally um, does, how, how long does it usually take, you know, when you have these kinds of, um, these sort of negative, um, negative things happening uh, or, you know, these things that, that, that tend to drive recessions, these variables. And like, how long do you, how long does it usually take in economy to, um, you know, take, have those problems with uh, credit, um, you know, retracting credit, uh, receding credit lines and things like that. And to, to turn into recession typically, is this, Unusual that it's been a couple of years and we're not in a recession now? Yes, it is. It is it's unusual. Normally, this is something that would happen within a quarter or two. Okay. Okay. So, no, so you would expect are, that now. And then with rates continue to go up. So what makes you think that? Well, why do you think it's delayed? And I guess what would make you think that, that it's going to happen now? So, yes, yeah, so flipping to the 
to the positive side and answering your question is uh, the biggest thing that has changed, the thing that is so different this time than ever before is as a result of all of the stimulus money that the government sent out, uh, savings are very high. And if you look at total deposits, which is, I think, a very one, at least one way of looking at savings, total deposits in commercial banks. But normally, these trend up steadily, decade after decade after decade. But in 24 months, from February 2020 to February 2022, these spiked by 35% almost a $5 trillion spike in, in deposits in just t- two years. This was completely off the charts in terms of how this compared to what normally happens with savings. We'd never seen anything like that in the past. Isn't so that really- strange with uh, inflation going up, though? You would think they'd be spending it. Well, so the reason that this spiked so much is because when the government sent out three rounds of yeah, helicopter money, right? stimulus checks, you get your check and what do you do with it? You deposit it and you deposit it in commercial banks. And so suddenly there's this very big surge in, um, in bank deposits, which also therefore resulted in a spike in M2 since M2 is one measure of the money supply sure. that contains not only the money that the Fed creates, but also deposits. And so but that's a more of a technical matter. Just We can just focus on the jump in deposits. Right. And so this has created a whole lot of spending power. Something you can almost think of this, the government spent so much money on stimulus, just they, I believe $5 trillion on stimulus alone with the Fed creating practically $4 trillion to finance that government spending. That's such a large amount of spending. It's practically spending on a war-like level. And when the government spends money on a war, like World War II, you tend to get an economic boom. And that's the situation I think we, we found ourselves in. I think that's more than any other reason why the economy has remained so hot for so long, why, why the job market is still strong, and why inflation has continued to be high for longer than most had expected it to be. Although there, although there are other factors at play in terms of inflation as well. What do you think happens next? I guess that's the uh, the question, I mean, do you, we, I mean, you have factors on both sides, but I mean, do you, do you have a sense or a feeling that, that, you know, one of these, uh, one of these things will prevail? Well, so let's jump back to the negative side. One thing that is, I think, worrying in the not too distant future is the resumption of student loan repayments. Student loans, the students who have a lot of, I think they say 45 million Americans have student loans. They haven't been required to pay anything on their student loans now going back to what uh, early 2020. And apparently it's beginning in October, they're all going to have to begin repaying their loans again. Now there's some uncertainty about whether President Biden's um, proposal to cancel a significant amount of this debt is going to be constitutional or unconstitutional. So we don't know if, if those students will have their debt canceled. Some of them may, but not all of them in any circumstance. I mean, under even if Biden's proposal is does make it through the courts, that's not going to cancel all the student debt. And the student loan resumption will begin in October. And if Biden's plan it doesn't make it through the courts and everyone with student debt has to begin repaying it again, that's probably going to be a significant blow to the economy and potentially to the stock market as well. As, uh, and things like Bitcoin, as the Bitcoin bros suddenly find that they have to stop speculating in crypto and start paying the government back again for their student loans, you could see that people forced to sell stocks uh, just in order to begin repaying their student loans. And 
also at the same time spending less on on consumption and dining out. So that could be a significant blow to the economy and to the financial markets. So your your thought is uh, that you know I guess that uh, the the student debt issue could push things over the uh, the edge in terms of uh, the recession. Is that is that where you're going with that? Yes. If um, yes, the severity. Mm-hmm. How big is the, how big is that? Um, you know, is the student debt uh, issue? And 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 I'm like, how many? What percentage of Americans does that affect? I'm just curious in terms of trying to understand like what the, you know, the impact of something like that would be the severity. So they say 45 million Americans have student loan debt. And the total amount of student loan debt is $1.6 trillion. But the, the pertinent amount is $1.3 trillion because that's the amount that the, uh, the government has extended to the students. And it would be part of the $1.3 trillion that would potentially or potentially not be canceled by the Biden plan but all of these loans will have to begin uh, servicing their debt again, starting in October. How, so how a, long have they very, been uh, forgiven? Like how long has it been since they were, you know, they haven't had to pay? I believe president Trump suspended these student loan repayments. I believe it was March, 2020 at the beginning of COVID. Okay. So, well, yeah, so that, that's a pretty significant, uh, that's a pretty significant, uh, amount of money going back into, you know, either savings or spending. Well, that's right. And again, it's going, the severity of this hit will depend on whether the Biden plan makes it through the courts or not, but either way it should, uh, should dent consumer spending and also the retail investors ability to invest. Interesting. So, um, so what, what, what do you see, what do you think the Fed's going to do now? You think they're going to continue? You, you mentioned twenty five basis points, but after that, you think they're going to you, they're going to put on the brakes for a bit and kind of see what happens. Especially with, I mean, I, don't, I mean, are they paying attention to some of these issues that you're talking about with student debt, that kind of thing? Um, I think they are. I, I think they are, and I, you know, I think the Fed is very transparent. Uh, generally speaking, if you watch their press conferences after the FOMC meetings. I don't think they're lying when they say the things that they say. They they say they're going to watch what's happening. Uh, They signal things in advance. So it was no surprise that they didn't hike at the most recent FOMC meeting. They say the next meeting is live, but they're more or less suggesting at this point that it's likely they will hike again. In fact, they've penciled in two more rate hikes for this year in their dot plot projections. But again, those are subject to revision depending on incoming data. And what the incoming data shows us is, yes, inflation has been coming down to 4.4% to 4%, as you mentioned, but the core level is actually higher and stickier. And their favorite measure of inflation is the personal consumption expenditure price index. And core there is 4.7%. And it's been stuck above 4.5% for the last six months or or so. And they're not getting the progress they want there in part, in large part, because there's still upward pressure on the, the, the rental component of inflation, which is quite significant, but they do expect that to come down uh, significantly over the next 12 months. You mean rents? You're talking about rents? That's right. Rent, uh, rent equivalents. Uh, make up a big part of the personal consumption expenditure price index. And year on year, that's still going up. But give it another six months and it'll start going, it'll be negative. I mean, we're already projecting, you know, two, um, just over 2%, two, 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 two and a half percent in some of our major markets, DFW, um, Phoenix, Scottsdale, some of those. So, Markets that were growing significantly have slowed down a lot already. So, um, so it's interesting. Right. How That's do they interpret? Call. How do they interpret um, 
this, you know, those kinds of details. And then you'd take bankruptcies and that I talked about before and the jobs. How, how do you think they look at these things when they seem to be giving such mixed signals? Well, so on the, the other major component of the PCE price index is, is the non-housing services. And that has still been stubbornly strong. And that's driven by, largely by employment and the number of jobs that are created and the average hourly earnings growth, which also has remained above where it probably needs to be to get inflation back down to their 2% inflation target. So they're, they're actually, they're, frankly, they don't say so, but they're hoping that the unemployment rate will go up and that wages will stop going up so much. In an ideal world, this can all happen without the U.S. going into recession. But in the real world, is not likely to. Normally, it requires a recession. The recession ends up throwing you know, millions of Americans out of work and wages stop rising and start falling, and inflation comes down soon after that and goes below the Fed's 2% inflation target. But so far, that hasn't happened, and I think in part going back to this enormous amount of savings that I was mentioning earlier has been supporting the economy despite all the Fed's rate hikes. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a strange thing to me again because, you know, I, I think of the money coming in, the hel- you know, this... this want to call it helicopter money or whatever is during COVID. Um, you know, in my mind that ha- that was the spending that was, it was triggering was, was what was one of the major factors behind inflation we were seeing, but you know, you're saying that it's basically in the bank, right? So, so it's, it's, it's a curious thing. Um, well, so it's interesting, Buck, because just because someone takes their stimulus check and deposits it and then spends that money, it doesn't make the money disappear. Wherever they spend it, but those some, people In somebody else's money. bank account, in other words. That's right. The deposits don't go away. The money is, once it's created, until it's destroyed through quantitative tightening, it doesn't go away. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's interesting. That, okay, that, that makes a lot more sense. So, um, so where do we go from here? So what's next? Well, okay, so let's, let's hit a few more negative points and then come back to some positive points. Okay. Um, first, the high interest rates, as you mentioned, it's already causing property prices to weaken. So that's likely to continue. Property prices or home prices are likely to fall. So one of the things that is reported in the what used to be called the flow of funds is household sector net worth or the wealth of the American public. The their owners, the assets, the real estate assets of the American public declined in the first quarter. So we're seeing wealth destruction on the property level already. So that's going to weigh on the economy. Another thing that I think is very significant is quantitative tightening. The Fed is destroying $95 billion a month through quantitative tightening, which is the opposite of quantitative easing. $95 billion adds up quickly. It's more than $1.1 trillion a year. And so as the Fed drains $1.1 trillion a year, that is going to um, take money out of the financial markets. That will remove these, that will cause the the savings to decline by that amount uh, indirectly. And so that's quantitative tightening is like the Fed removing the oxygen from a ballroom full of investors. At first, the investors don't realize it, but eventually it becomes difficult to breathe. And at that point, they all run for the exits. So it takes some time, but, and, and we haven't gotten there yet. And in fact, since QT started in April last year or thereabouts, um, the Fed had destroyed about $600 billion, which was a significant amount. But then when the Silicon Valley Bank crisis happened, just within a matter of weeks, they created $400 billion and pumped it back into the financial markets again through loans to banks and various, various uh, channels that created money again. So they undid about 60% of QT in just three weeks. And now they're almost, now they have been destroying money again steadily since March. 
And so they're more or less back to where they were in March before, before the Silicon Valley Bank issue started. So we had a three or four month reprieve where the Fed was not in, in net on net taking additional money out, but actually injecting more oxygen back into the ballroom. But now we're once again getting to the point where we were back in March and they're going to continue with QT. So that's going to drain financial liquidity out of the financial markets for, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. But there is a lot of liquidity to be drained. So we'll have to see. This could go on for a year or longer before they have to change course. So that's a, that's a negative. And sooner or later, that will catch up with us. Another thing to be very concerned about is asset prices really are still very inflated. Of course, home prices skyrocketed during the pandemic, and stocks did as well. And so if you look at something that I keep an eye on, the wealth to income ratio, it's, it's extremely high by past standards. The wealth to income ratio is calculate, calculated like this. It takes the household sector net worth, in other words, the wealth of all the Americans, their, all their assets minus all their liabilities, net worth, divided by disposable personal income. So wealth to income. Now, typically, going back to 1950, the average for this wealth to income ratio has been about 550%. During the NASDAQ bubble, it shot up to a new high of 620. And then that bubble popped and went back to its long-term average. Then during the property bubble, it went up to 670%. And then that bubble popped and it went back to its long-term average as asset prices crashed. But now it's, the previous high was 670 now it's 760. So it's way above where it was in 2008 before that crisis started. And suggesting that, you know, if things, if anything goes wrong, it could go very wrong. So that's another thing to worry about, particularly regarding stocks. And another, you know, it's also another reason to expect home prices to keep falling significantly. So those are uh, quite a few of the negatives. But there are some other positives as well. Again, the main one being all of the savings that I've already pointed to. But another is the AI revolution. You know, this has suddenly generated a tremendous amount of animal spirits, if you will. And it's on, you know, I'm no expert on artificial intelligence. I know you've done some podcasts on the subject and probably know much more about it than I do. But from where I'm standing, it seems to me that this is the most significant development since the development of the internet with potentially even greater repercussions. And you can see with NVIDIA's performance, in terms of the impact on stocks, we may see this alone drive you know, the Super 7 up to potentially significantly higher levels. I'm not sure. Who knows? You, know, you just mean by but, like, you know, robots trading and that kind of thing? Or, or what, what do you mean? Just in terms of uh, investment. Investment. That will, yeah, that's the thing is I, I'm trying to understand, like, you know, part of, I don't even know how you invest in AI, really. Um, you know, that, that, that <laughs> there's some companies that are using AI, but I, you think the idea of the technology will drive investment into companies that are utilizing AI? And companies use, utilizing AI, of course, will have to spend a lot of money on chips. Oh, yeah. yeah. And AI um, engineers and even prompt engineering yeah. <laughs> engineer. Yeah, sure. And we could just see a really rapid change in the way that work is conducted. Almost and like sort of the uh, inter likely internet. to involve a lot of investment. And which would benefit the economy. And also it would probably fuel even more speculation than we've seen so far, potentially driving these tech shares potentially significantly higher. I mean, they've gone up a lot, but we're nowhere near the sort of crazy bubble levels that we were during the NASDAQ bubble. And this, this has the potential of you know, being at least as transformative as that. So I, I view that as a potential positive for the economy. And then on a less dramatic scale, but still very significant, I think all of the investment programs that were passed in, in the preceding two years, the Infrastructure Act, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, 
those things are going to result in probably hundreds of billions of dollars being invested in infrastructure and other projects that will be rolled out gradually. This is not all going to hit this year or next year, but it is going to build up over the next several years and probably provide significant support to, to economic growth. So I, I view that as a, as a positive. And then also another positive for, particularly for stocks, is the U.S. current account deficit it hit a new all-time record high last year with the U.S. importing much more than it exported. So the current account grew out to almost $950 billion last year. The previous peak had been about $850 billion back in 2006. Uh, during, so the reason this is significant is the current account balance has to be exactly offset by capital inflows into the United States. Every country's balance of payments has to balance. So it's like, a, a, in this respect, it is like a family's budget. If a family spends more than it earns, then it has a deficit. It has to borrow or sell something to someone outside the household, meaning that, so in, uh, applying this to a country, that means that if we have a current account deficit, that exactly the same amount of money has to come into the United States on the capital and financial account surplus. So the larger the current account deficit becomes, the more foreign capital comes into the United States. And the more foreign capital comes in the United States, the easier it is, it, it tends to push up asset prices. Interesting. So what, um, all this happening at once, and <laughs> it causes a great big explosion, right, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. so you have, you know, there are clear things to worry about, the inflated asset prices, quantitative tightening, credit slowing. But on the other hand, there are these things that are also supporting the economy that we, we haven't seen either. We've never seen them or we haven't seen them for a long time. What do you make of uh, the, you know, we also have, I mean, it's still a ways, a little while away, but I, w I would think that's good. The, the, on, uh, you know, the presidential election 2024, uh, that is probably likely, I mean, at least historically we've seen is, is uh, to affect the behavior of the Fed. They're, you know, they're probably not going to be raising rates a whole lot in 2024, that kind of thing. That. Yes. I, well, I think by 2024, the economy will be in recession and they'll be cutting rates for that reason, because it, I, it probably won't be that much longer before. Do you the, think they're going to cut rates? You, you think that you, you think they're going to cut rates? Well, yes. I mean, when the inflation, when, when there is a recession, if there is a recession, I believe there will be. When that happens, then unemployment will go up. Wages will start falling. The inflation rate will come down. And when the inflation rate comes down below the Fed's 2% inflation target, you know, it may not be long before we're flirting with deflation again, depending on the severity of the recession. And so, yes, the interest rates are high now. The Fed doesn't want the interest rates to be high if, if that's not necessary to kill inflation. So as soon as inflation really begins to start to go below the Fed's 2% inflation target, they'll be very quick to cut. And of course, that's another thing that will spur the speculators in the prospect of lower interest rates is another reason that will asset prices, or at least stock prices, will tend to be more supported than they would be in a stable interest rate environment. It sort of just doesn't make sense, like when you think about it, though, right? I mean, you've got that like a recession would ultimately spur <laughs> the markets to rally because of rate cuts. It just doesn't you make any you sense at all. So, but, yeah. but they often say, no, no, you know, no, no. they right. always talk about bad news being good news yeah. in those environments. Right. right. Well, uh, interesting stuff. Um, anything else you want to share before we uh, we cut out here? No, I think we've hit on the, the main, yeah. main points. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of information here. And it's always uh, interesting to get your take. Richard, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Buck. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about Macro Watch, though. Um, Macro Watch is the, the newsletter. I have been a subscriber before, and, and it's just, I think it's a, 
you know, for people who really try to try to understand what's going on in the world, I think it's a very useful, um, it's a very useful newsletter. And you also have some introductory type videos that help people understand your view of the economy. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Thank you, Buck. Yes. So macro watch is a video newsletter that I started almost 10 years ago. And every couple of weeks I make a new, essentially it's a PowerPoint presentation with me discussing something important happening in the global economy. Uh, the theme of macro watch that runs through macro watch, the main themes are that credit growth drives economic growth, that liquidity determines the direction of asset prices and that the government attempts to control both credit growth and liquidity to make sure that the economy keeps growing and doesn't implode, frankly. And so it's very important to monitor these things. And so MacroWatch does focus on the Fed, what other central banks around the world are doing, on government policy, and generally all the major macroeconomic factors that in one way or the other influence the direction of stocks, bonds, property, currencies, and commodities. So every two weeks I upload a new video. And if you're, the, the videos tend to be about 20 minutes long and have 30 or 40 charts that can be downloaded. So I hope your listeners will, will check out MacroWatch. They can find it on my website, which is richardduncaneconomics.com. That's richardduncaneconomics.com. And if they would like to subscribe, hit the subscribe button and use the discount coupon code formula. And with that discount code formula, you can subscribe at a 50% subscription discount. I think they'll all find it very affordable. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, I, I highly recommend it. I mean, I think it's, uh, again, I think one of the, the thing that's really hard is that, you know, and, and you hear me asking me these questions that, it's really hard to make sense of what's going on. So it's useful to have somebody like Richard walk you through what's going on um, and trying to make sense of it. So um, again, uh, Richard, thank you so much for being on wealth formula podcast again. And uh, let's try not to make it another 15 months, uh, which these days is equivalent to about 150 years <laughs> in terms of economic <laughs> changes. Like I look forward to the next time. Thank you. All right. Take care. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Before I go, I just wanted to remind you that, you know, I've also uh, got another podcast. A uh, podcast is called Sapio with Buck Joffrey, S-A-P-I-O. And uh, now that I've had like seven or eight of these uh, episodes already, and they're really interesting and if you're interested in living a long time and living healthy and that kind of thing, definitely tune in. It's really a really fascinating show. And believe me, I'm not like, you know, one of those crazy people who's, you know, uh, eating protein clumps uh, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing like you read about in the news. But there's a lot of things that you can do that probably add, add good years to your life that we know about right now. And we're also going to be talking a lot about the futuristic stuff that might be coming along the way. So again, check that out. It's APO with Buck Joffrey. And if you like it, make sure you, you know, subscribe. And if you really like it, give me a good review. I would appreciate it. Anyway, that's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.